We will now move on to our last working group, which is co-chaired by our own Andrea Bearfield and Susie Painter March. Uh, Andrea Bearfield represents Waco City Council District 1, and she is currently the executive director of the Texas Brazos Trail Region. Before that, she was the Main Street Manager for, the, for City Center Waco, where she developed, cultivated, and grew a sense of community in the core of Waco through historic preservation, economic development, and placement. Andrea is a native of Waco and the daughter of Waco Mayor May Jackson, who herself was a social worker by trade here in Waco. So all that to say, Andrea brings in your lifetime worth of knowledge of the social service ecosystem in Waco. She sits on many, many boards, including Prosper Waco, which is our local collective impact initiative, making her the perfect leader of this task force. Her co-leader is Susie Painter March, who is the executive director of Prosper Waco, um, as I mentioned, our local collective impact initiative. Susie has held advocacy and leadership roles with the Southwest Educational Development Laboratory, the Christian Life Commission, the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, and Pastors for Texas Children. Through these endeavors and her affiliation with many other associations and groups, she has worked on issues ranging from education to poverty to prison reform. Um, thank you both so much for volunteering to lead this effort. And with that, I will hand it over to our Mayor Pro Tem, Andrea Bearfield. Thank you, Councilmember Meek. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council and staff and all those in the in interwebs. Um, we are really excited about um, the opportunity to really drill down into the work that was already happening and, and bringing as much help or resource as possible to the hardworking organizations in this community that, that we've been charged to look through and serve in social services and education um, response to COVID-19, uh, Mayor Deaver asked us to provide a method to facilitate and communicate about issues and opportunities related to COVID-19 and its impact on each of the working areas. He asked us to help us engage our community partners and address those issues, and he asked us to provide better leadership and communication to those issues as we were working through the crisis and towards recovery. Um, the ability for you know, he, he he asked, we say yes. And the fact that working alongside... Line muted. Line unmuted. ...has, you know, been in and out of Waco a long time, but very connected to our social services organizations and our, our community and our groups and our pastors was incredibly important. And that she is the head of our... Um, uh, Collective Impact Organization, Prosper Waco, and the backbone organization for that 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 serves as support was was on a near perfect alignment. So it has been my pleasure to be on the phone or on a Zoom with Susie every day for the past two weeks um, because we have had a lot to do. Um, I'm gonna even switch to the next slide. Is um, we um, going through actually the next two? Uh, going through the things that we, we wanted to do was trying to figure out, you know, what our process was going to be. So I'll allow Susie to come on and talk about what the process is and, and, and ident identify who we were dealing with. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Um, one thing about our sector of social services and education is that every single organization is operating as a business, a nonprofit business, and every single organization is also simultaneously responding to the needs of their clients. So there is a lot of stress in our in our system because we we have the best in town in every way uh, in terms of leadership and commitment. But each, each of these organizations is struggling to readapt their processes uh, to make things work, and so for the benefits of their clients. So one of the things that uh, was very clear about our committee is that uh, we didn't have the luxury of any kind of strategic planning, but, you know, we just jumped straight to strategic action. So in order to help out, we, there had already been two community surveys, from community organizations, so we had some input from our nonprofit community about where their needs were. Also, we did a second survey for the faith community to hear some of their concerns. And um, 
so as a result of that, we began um, to clarify this process, which was, okay, let's take an issue. Somebody brings an issue to us. Let's clarify the problem. Let's convene the players for that problem. Let's change what process needs to be changed or what new process needs to be added. Because nine times out of ten, it's just like school. Okay, we had school, right? Now we got a new way of doing school. So what processes are changing in order to serve the clients? And then what is problematic in that change? And how can we help our constituency move to at least step one of a solution uh, within a week? So rinse and repeat, do that again, over and over again, for a list of issues that are being uh, brought forward in our community. Uh, go to the next slide. Our, um, so here are some of the things that have come up immediately for us. Uh, of course, it was child care for essential workers. Um, how, how could we change our existing child care? As you know, most of our child care centers operate on a school calendar. So when school is out, child care is out. And that has created um, a lot of need in our community. Um, add to that the need for social distancing and special uh, regulations. You know, so just gathering information about that. We heard that there was a need for formula, baby formula. Just, uh, you may not have heard of it as much as toilet paper, but <laughs> yeah, the need is, is great out there. And so uh, addressing, you know, immediately creating a strike force around that, finding out what was the, where was the issue. Elder care, checking in on those uh, in, in Waco and surrounding community. Uh, one of the most difficult problems that we uh, face right now is medical need for the homeless and trying to um, work with our entire homeless coalition, all of our service providers who, um, you know, I, I guess I'll say this clearly, our service providers in the homeless sector, they, uh, their programming is not set up to be 24-7. They provide services to a population. They don't provide alternative 24-hour home. But now, um, under the shelter-in-place uh, ordinances and the, the way in which their community needs to respond, there's a lot of demand on those services. Um, so that's shelter capacity and uh, the need for mobile charging stations. School meals, uh, the on-site delivery, just gathering volunteers in 48 hours to staff up school meal delivery sites. Um, that was a pretty impressive um, response in our community. And the in increasing family meal insecurity that we're seeing now, especially on weekends and as uh, there's more fragile condition in businesses. Uh, the alternative education processes that are going on in different districts, just being aware of those. Our faith community, their functional challenges that have to do with how do you do a wedding, how do you do a funeral, all those sorts of logistical things, right down to the spiritual and emotional needs of congregants and the response of mourning families in the face of death, which, of course, we experienced not just in a theoretical way, but we've all felt it in our community um, with the loss of Principal Perry. Um, volunteer coordination, how do you volunteer when you can't go out, right? And uh, so that's, that's another um, changing landscape. How do we adapt to that? And then, of course, dealing with our um, uh, all the problems that come from Spanish speakers not having uh, clear information and, and a pipeline and a place to go. And uh, whether that's immigrant issues or just language barrier issues. So these are some of the strike force issues that have presented themselves in the last seven or eight days. Thank you so much, Susie. Um, one of the things that, that we know is that the, the group that we are governing uh, or shepherding, really, it'll, it'll continue to evolve. Um, as the time goes by, the needs of, of, of our vulnerable populations will grow. You know, as, as long as we are under, under the ordinance and or under the or declaration that we serve, you know, these needs are going to continue to grow. So what we had to do and what we were glad to do was to go ahead and get, get those people in place so that we could 
you know, potentially address some of our problems and get to get to a solution or step one of the solution as Susie identified. Mm -hmm. Go to the next slide. Um, we have made some progress. Um, it is not done by any means because, again, like I said, this will evolve. But when we we broke down the for the child care for the essential workers, you know, immediately the YMCA stepped up um, and the Boys and Girls Club stepped up and we were able to identify a place that, uh, the essential workers could take their children. Um, some of the downfall to that, though, is that we have heard that in order to um, hold your place in whatever daycare facility that you were going to, you have to pay still. So there are people who are being charged twice. So we're trying to work through the processes of, of, of how, you know, how that cannot be because, you know, again, our dollars are, are sensitive right now. And but, you know, if you're an essential worker, your children do have to be taken care of. Um, regarding the WIC, um, the two things happen. I mean, of course, our, our um, health district has the um, fantastic new WIC mobiles, and they got themselves parked in the health district parking lot, so they have done drive-through services that, pay, that mothers can go and pick up the, the supplies that they need that they weren't able to find in the stores. But the other thing is that from a communal standpoint, social media activated and galvanized around each other, and they set up Facebook, Facebook groups were set up, and mothers said, hey, you know, I don't have this, but I have this. And so they started, you know, working and shipping and dropping off on porches things to one another. So that was one when, when not only the uh, organizations and leadership stepped up, but the people just kind of wrapped their arms around each other and got that worked out. Um, elder care, we started talking with uh, Hot Cog and the Council on Aging and making sure that the nursing homes were, um, it, that they didn't have any needs, that they weren't being able to meet. I mean, with everything going on lockdown and only people, essential people coming in and out, you know, they're trying to mitigate the, the ability for uh, the community, community spread that we've seen in other communities, um, that the Meals on Wheels are still active and they... If, if your doctor's appointment is still essential, rural transit is still making sure people get there. The uh, Council on Aging also has people who are willing to go and shop for seniors if they can't. So there are uh, definitely resources available for our elder community. The medical needs for the homeless, we've been working diligently with the, housing, the Homeless Coalition and, um, you know, alternative sites for those who tested positive who test positive, which at this time that I know of, we have had no positive cases within our homeless community. Um, but we are preparing uh, in case there are positive or suspected positives for there to be an alternative medical site. And those sites are being reviewed today and, and to, to see what. So we are in progress of, of making sure that there are resources in place. Um, our shelter capacity, we... As Susie said, we've been talking with those organizations daily. Um, we presented an, uh, uh, we're presented with the problem that a lot of our, our sheltered and unsheltered homeless community use our city facilities for uh, as a place to charge their phones so that they can continue to have access to resources. Well, there are still plugs outside of buildings, but, um, you know, we spoke with staff, and it was one of those things where, you know, we have had at one point um, – promotional charging state, solar charging stations, right? So um, what would happen if an organization ordered several of those? And we had several churches that immediately raised their hand and said, we will do it. So that's one of those things that we were able to, to offer a solution for, or step one to a solution. Uh, regarding our education partners, you know, each, each individual school are, are monitoring their, their alter, alternate education, alternate al alternative education methods, and so we are making sure that that information is, is succinct and, and in our communication effort um, regarding the meals on site and delivery. Um, there are no more weekend meals with Waco ISD, but um, there has been a great uh, community and church response. Um, we're there. A lot of organizations are working with the referred families of Waco ISD, so between their um, uh, school nurses or their uh, student coordinators, they are, are getting a list together of those, those families who may be in need and providing meals for them on the weekends. So we've gotten uh, a good connectivity of how those families won't have to go without, um, and that's dealing with the family meal insecurity. 
for our, our faith leaders um, and our faith community function, we have had a great, great deal of partnership and work with uh, uh, Central Texas Interfaith Alliance um, with Liz Lagawa uh, coordinating. At one point, there was a call with more than 150 clergy on the call with the mayor, Mayor Deaver, and with uh, County Judge Scott Felton to talk about uh, some of the things and difficulties that were happening within the faith community um, with Easter being this weekend, Palm Sunday being, and First Sunday being last weekend, what were the things that they could do? And out of that and those conversations, they've had several conversations and created kind of a, a, a task force within the faith leaders, and they've created what, um, what they have called the Waco Faith Leaders Pledge, and um, it's, it, it says that in the face of this global pandemic, faith leaders have a responsibility to serve in ways that promote the well-being of our members and also that of a larger community as we act in faith and wisdom to provide pastoral care, connection, and guidance during these unprecedented times. We pledge to keep at the center of our decision-making the lives and well-being of those in our community from our youngest to our eldest. That is why I stand with local faith communities in following the guidelines of our local ordinances and pledge to stay at home, not hold public worship gatherings until the local ordinances are lifted. I am faithfully serving my members and community by staying at home and not holding public worship and gatherings. I am making my community safer for those working on the front lines in our hospitals and on our streets to keep us safe. The more faith leaders who take this pledge and stay at home and not hold public worship gatherings, the more lives we will save together. And that's, you know, with the hashtag Waco Cares, home is safe, care from home, and safe at home. So the faith leaders have done a, a tremendous job in, in gathering together and making a pledge to keep their neighbors safe until the ordinances are lifted. Um, we have been working to gather community information and volunteer coordination. So Prosper Waco has mounted up workingwacotogether.org slash COVID um, to field some of those questions and gather the information sources. And thank you to all the things that um, the communication work team has done because I know that they've worked in tandem to share and cross-promote that information. Um, folks like... Um, Act Locally Waco, and as well as all of our media institutions and organizations working at making sure our social media presence is there and getting the information out so people can answer our, our the regular questions and the brimming questions on COVID-19. Finally, um, we've been working with our immigrant population um, to make sure that there was a manner in which resources could be uh, made available to um, our non-Spanish speaking residents. And so we have, um, are mounting a community funded call center for Spanish language users. And so that will be a one hub that, that anyone who is a, a non-English speaker could go and receive information. And that was, that was propped up by one of our, our community foundations because we knew that, that, that was, that was an audience, a particularly vulnerable audience who may not get the information and may feel unsafe to do so. So we wanted to make a way that, that they would be included in getting as much information and access to resources as possible. Um, we've still got a lot of work to do, but um, this, is, this is the progress that we've made. Susie, is there anything that I left out? No, I think, I think you've, uh, you've pretty much covered it. This is um, it's a great um, community of responders. And just to remind you, we do have um, a community leaders call on every Wednesday. We have a community support organizations that are funders and donors, and we have a faith leaders call. And those are uh, our basic tools of uh, communication within our large sector. And we're in communication with our school districts as well. Amazing work. The breadth and scope of what you're working on is very extensive and um, much applause to you. I think this is um, definitely um, noble work and I'm, I'm personally grateful. Uh, any questions uh, from the council for Councilmember Bearfield or um, Susie? 
I'd just like, now this is Mayor right. Deaver, I would just like to say uh, thank you for all this great work. Uh, I'm especially grateful for the work that you all are doing on homeless. Uh, this is a critical need for our community and, and, and we're approaching it in the right way, in a collaborative way with community partners. And uh, the city will support that work, but we can't lead that work. And, and I, I really appreciate the leadership that, uh, that you all are giving to this. Um, and I also want to thank Liz Lagawa for organizing that uh, call with the clergy. Uh, it was actually one of the pastors that was on that call uh, who suggested the pledge. I think it a, was a brilliant idea, and I'm so grateful to the members of the, of the faith leadership that, have, that are taking that pledge uh, to, to try to uh, encourage, well, for them to stay home, for their uh, churches not to gather, and then also for them to encourage uh, their, their members to comply with the orders and uh, keep everyone safe. Excellent. Any, uh, any other questions? Thank you, Councilmember Bearfield and Susie, so much. Um, I just want to say again how thankful I am for each chair and participant of these groups. Um, Waco is moving quickly and strategically. <clears throat> I don't think any of us are pretending that we're perfect, but it is such a joy to see so many in our community step up and care for the concerns of our city. And they are working diligently to approach these matters collaboratively and excellently. Um, I'd uh, I just keep it up. Let us know how we can um, help each of you as you're working. And the last thing I'll say before um, I turn it back over to the mayor is I want to um, just give a quick thank you to our mayor um, and city staff who have put in untold long hours working hard away from their families to make sure that this city continues to function smoothly. So. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, staff. Um, and uh, thank you to each uh, participant of these working groups. Uh, I will turn it back over to the Mayor. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you very much, Dylan. I want to thank all the council members uh, and their working team co-chairs, uh, all their key partners and the staff liaisons, which we had not mentioned up till now. Um, and those are uh, for the business and individual financial recovery, Millette Harrison for strategic communication, Larry Holsey for health response and coordination, Dr. Brenda Gray, and for social services and education, uh, Galen Price. Um, the, uh, the collaboration uh, is, is amazing and, and leveraging this uh, collaboration with our key partners will help our city get through this uh, and we'll come out stronger on the other side. Um, going forward, I'd like to ask uh, the staff liaisons to work with co-chairs, with the council member and co-chair, to send a brief uh, one-page report on any new developments after, after y'all meet to uh, Council Member Meek and the City Manager's Office. And then I'd like to ask Council Member Meek to work with staff to compile a weekly report on the work of each of the working teams that would be distributed to me, the other council members and staff. I just want to be sure we're, uh, I've been getting emails from some of you and I really appreciate those. I think we need to consolidate that and be sure all the, all the council members and, uh, and city management and staff are, are seeing this uh, because there are things that, there, there have been instances of things that staff has been working on that they didn't realize uh, working teams were working on and we just need to smooth out the communication a little bit. I think Dylan can really help with that. Uh, and I, Dylan, I appreciate you facilitating uh, this, this work as well. Uh, finally, I want to thank uh, our Deputy City Manager, Bradley Ford, for uh, helping to put this together. I think this is, you, you can see how important this work is. And uh, this was his idea and wouldn't have begun had he not uh, suggest, suggested this to me. So thank you, Bradley.